So, <clears throat> so good, uh, good morning, everyone. So first of all, uh, I want to talk. I want to talk about our midterm two, and I think so. This week we should be able to finish lecture nineteen. All right. So the midterm two, I think I will schedule it on. I will send the email <clears throat> later, but I think I can schedule it on Wednesday to Friday you know, next week. So we can we can. I can give you three days to work on it, but most likely you can, <clears throat> you won't spend too much time on this uh, midterm exam. So three days, you pick any time, three, two or three hour time to work on the midterm exam. So the deadline, uh, I can set it to be Friday night, 12 p.m., 12 a.m. <clears throat> and <clears throat> given that, uh, I think homework seven is already due, so, well, homework eight, uh, you can already, you can start to work on homework eight already. Because we, at least we covered, I think, the first uh, one or two problems. Yeah, so I will post uh, the solutions before the exam so that you can check the details. So, yeah. I think you still need to submit. Yeah, but I think I will post the solutions before the before the uh before the home, uh, exam deadline. But the deadline for homework homework eight will be set to you no, know, sometime next week. So yeah, so uh, I think in that case, since the solutions has been posted before the uh, submission deadline, so I will. I will just give everybody four mark for the homework eight. If you submit the submit your solution, just like the homework five. Okay. So if you have any questions, I will send an email and uh, make an announcement later. So if you have any questions, uh, you can send me an email. But the format should be you know, the same as midterm one. So, okay, so last time we talked about how to compute the joint PDF <clears throat> of two random variables, U and V. <clears throat> well, each of them is defined as a function of another two random variables. Okay. So this is essentially a transformation from X and Y to U and V. And the transformation is through these G and H functions, nonlinear functions. And to do that, we can use an extended fundamental theorem. Well, we just basically solve, based on these two equations, solve the roots. Once we find out the roots, we can evaluate the Jacobian uh, at those roots. And then we just plug them into the fundamental, uh, extended fundamental theorem. And here to compute the Jacobian, there are two different approaches. Either we can compute this J, X, I, Y, I at each root, right? X, Y, I, I is the root of this set of equations. Now following this way, we compute the partial gradient uh, of G and H with regard to X and Y, and then evaluate this partial gradient at these roots and then compute this Jacobian matrix, Jacobian. Now, the other way is to compute this so-called J, I, U, and V, which is defined as uh, this guy. Well, in each entry, uh, we are taking derivatives of G, I, and H, I. Now, what are the G, I, and H, I? Um, it is defined as the when you solve for the roots, essentially for each root, x, i, and y, i, we will ex express them in terms of G, u and v uh, through a certain function. Right? So we call these functions g, i, and h, i, once you solve these roots. So we are taking the derivatives of these g, i, and h, i's with regard to u and v.
So some, it depends on the problem that we're looking at. Sometimes this one works better. Sometimes this, the other form uh, will be more convenient to compute. I think last time when we deal with this uh, IID Gaussian uh, random, random points over a two-dimensional plane, it turns out that uh, this format is simpler. Because this x x one we only have one root x one y one. Well, this they are each of them are functions of r and theta, and this function is very simple. If you want to do it the other way, uh, the expression is going to be like this one. It's going to be very complicated square root and arctangent functions, but I believe you can get the same result. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have been discussing this random variable u, which is a function of two random variables. And because this is a new random variable defined in this, uh, in this way, so we can define all the st statistics of, for this new random variable, such as the mean variance and all those standard statistics. So for example, the mean expectation of this new random variable is defined uh, in this way, which is a quite standard definition of expectation. It's basically the realization of the random variable uh, weighted by the density. Right? And because the random variable is defined through X and Y, so here we use the density, a joint density of X and Y. And then we integrate this weighted uh, realization over all the space x and y, and we have we have mentioned before that expectation by itself is a linear operator, so it works for. Uh, it can be decomposed for any number of uh, uh, the summation over any number of random variables. Okay, so it's this is a linear operator that can be applied to any random variables, there's no requirement on the independence or correlation of these random variables. It could be arbitrary. So we have this mean, which is kind of the, uh, this, this mean uh, def definition for this U random variable, which is kind of the uh, most standard, most basic statistics or the first order statistics. And uh, Following the previous discussion on moments of random variables, here we can also define joint moments of a pair of random variables, okay? Which is basically denoted as uh, the moment KR, this subscripts represents the order of the moments of each random variable. Now the precise definition is simply, first we take product, of x to the power of k times y to the power of r, while k and r are some integers, positive integers. And then this forms a new random variable. And then we take the expectation of this new random variable. Okay. If you ignore or if you remove y, then this becomes the definition of moment for a single random variable. So this definition is a very straightforward generalization of uh, the moment. And because the expectation is taken over X and Y, so by definition, it is calculated uh, by this double integration. So in this, uh, so in particular, for the one 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 one's moment, if you set k equals to r equals to one, this moment is, which is the mo uh, basic, one of the most basic moments. Now you plug in k equals to r equals to one into this definition. This moment is essentially the expectation of the product of these two random variables. And we call this one, very special moment, we call this one the correlation 
between x and y. So we denote it as R x y. So this is a very special uh, definition. Basically, if this one, if this expectation equals to zero, we say these two random variables are uncorrelated. Otherwise, we say they are correlated. This is a definition. So, it, uh, so, so essentially, if this is zero, we say they are uncorrelated, or sometimes we say they are orthogonal. Oh, I think I think I um, mixed this one with the uncorrelated definition. Uncorrelated means another thing. So, so here, okay, let me rephrase my statement. So this is the definition of correlation between X and Y. Now, if this correlation equals to zero, we, we call it orthogonal, okay? Think about this is a kind of a two, vect two vectors in the two dimensional space. And such an expectation is very similar to the dot product. So we call them orthogonal. Yeah, uncorrelated means another thing, which we will talk about later. So this is, again, it's a definition. Now, here's a very important uh, definition called covariance. The covariance is defined between X and Y is defined as, is denoted as CXY, which is now following this definition. So here we are, we, we first look at the deviation of each random variable from its mean. Right, so this is a deviation from the mean. We know the mean is a constant. So X minus mean is the deviation from the mean. And here's the deviation uh, of Y from its mean. Now we take the product of these two deviations, which forms a new random variable, right? Inside this product can be viewed as a function defined on these two random variables, X and Y. So inside is a new random variable. Now we take the expectation of this new random variable and call that the covariance. So this definition generalizes the variance definition of a single random variable. If you set y to be x, so let y equals to x, then cxx, which is the covariance between x and itself, will reduce, reduce to the definition of uh, variance. Right. If you set x equals to y, then this becomes expectation x minus ex to the power of two, right? because then these two will be the same. So we have a square inside which is exactly sigma x squared, the variance of x, right? So the covariance is a more general definition in this sense. Right? So, so we have this uh, correlation and covariance. These are the, probably the most the two fundamental statistics between a pair of random variables. Okay, so let's continue to lecture 18. So we have this covariance definition. Uh, and if you expand this product, by following this derivation, if you expand the product into four terms, and then utilize the linearity of expectation uh, on these four terms. After simplification, you get another, sometimes it is a simpler expression. Uh, you get another expression for the covariance, right? CXY is equals to the expectation of XY minus the product of the individual expectations. It's basically the core, this is the correlation subject, the product of the expectations. Now, this is very similar to our, when we, when we introduce the variance of a single random variable. Right. 
we have another characterization, which is the expectation of x squared minus e x to the power of two. So if you set y equals to x in this way, you will get that characterization for a single random variable. <clears throat> so this is to say, if we want to compute the covariance, which is a very important statistics between x and y, we have to compute their individual mean as well as their uh, the mean of their product. So essentially, to compute these expectations, we need to know the joint for, to compute this term. We need to know the joint density. And to compute these expectations, we need to marginalize the joint densities to the marginal densities first, and then utilize the marginal densities to compute these ex expectations, individual expectations. Yeah. We will see some examples right after this. So it's, this is not a easy task, in, in, even in some simple cases. And for this covariance, if, if we view it as an operator, we have the following uh, nice properties. One is the linearity. Well, if we look at the covariance between these two random variables, x plus y and u plus v, right? Each of them is defined as an addition of two random variables. Now, if you look at the, this, the covariance between these two pairs, these two random variables, we can actually decompose them into uh, the several terms that are depending on the covariance between each individual pair of random variables. Okay, so you can see this can be decomposed into x and u, x and v, y and u, y and v, which is very similar to the distributive rule of multiplication. And uh, the second property is the scaling rule. Uh, <clears throat> we are looking at the covariance between these two random variables. Well, the first one is ax plus b, but a and b are some constants, okay. only x is the random variable. This is like a linear function on this random variable x. The other is cy plus d. Now the, the covariance between these two is equals to a times c, which is the product of their coefficients multiplied by the covariance between x and y. So this b and d, they do not affect the covariance. I think when we when we talk about variance, we have a similar formula, which is variance of ax plus b equals to a square variance x. Right. So the offset doesn't affect the variance; only the coefficient affects the scaling part. So. If you view variance as the covariance between this random variable and itself, then you can apply uh, this property and get the same conclusions. A times A covariance between X and X, right? which is A squared. Uh, this one happened to be variance of X. So this is the scaling rule of variance, of covariance. And in many cases, we talk about uh, this normalized covariance, which we call it the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is normalizing the covariance between X and Y by their standard by the product of their standard deviation, sigma x, sigma y. Okay. The reason that we introduce, uh, we want to introduce this normalized covariance or this correlation coefficient 
is that we can show that this, this uh, row x, y is normalized uh, correlation coefficient is between negative one and one. So it's kind of like, if you think about the, in the two dimensional space for, for two dimensional vectors, we have an angle, right? The angle between that vector and the x axis. And the cosine theta is between negative one and one. And for random variables, we have something very similar. Um, for two between uh, for two random variables, we can define this so-called correlation coefficient, which is a normalized statistics uh, that is between zero uh, negative one and one. And this statistics characterizes how this how co correlated are these two random variables. Are they positively correlated or negatively correlated? So this is a very, very nice definition of the that characterizes the that quantifies their correlation in a normalized way. Of course, if you want to compute this, you have to compute C X Y first, and also compute the sigma X sigma Y, which is the you know, square root of the variance of these two random variables. And uh, this is a simple fact says that <clears throat> the covariance be reduces to the correlation when these two random variables are zero mean. And this is obvious because when these are zero mean, so these two expectations are zero. So we only have X times Y inside this expectation, outer expectation. And that reduces to the correlation, definition of correlation. So we say uh, these two are positive correlated if uh, C X, Y greater than zero, which is equivalent to say rho X, Y is bigger than zero. Right? But they are negatively correlated if this rho and C, they are negative because the standard deviation is always positive. Right? <clears throat> yeah, and we have, uh, we can show it can be shown that this normalized, this correlation coefficient is between negative one and one. So this covariance, its magnitude will always be smaller than this product. And also with the, uh, this row X, Y implies the connection, the relation between Y and X in certain special cases. For example, if we, if you, if you see that this row X, Y equals to one for a pair of random variables, X and Y, you can directly conclude that Y and X, uh, they, are they are linearly correlated with a positive correlation. So, which means you can always ex express one random variable y in terms of another one via a linear function. And in particular, the coefficient of this linear function a is positive. So in this case, they are perfect, they are perfectly positively correlated. So y is a positive scaling of x plus some constant offset. Now in the in another extreme case, if rho equals to negative one, that means again, y can be written as a linear function of x with a negative uh, co coefficient. And in the middle, if rho x, y happens to be zero, okay, if this ratio is zero, which means C X Y is zero. Now, if C X Y is zero, <clears throat> okay. So if row X Y is zero, then we can conclude that this numerator has to be zero. So C X Y must be zero. Okay. But C X Y equals to zero. If we go back here. 
utilizing this equivalent uh, formulation of CXY, then we conclude that expectation of XY must be equals to expectation of X times expectation of Y, right? because this term has to be zero. <clears throat> so equivalently speaking, if this correlation coefficient is zero, then the product of the, the expectation of the product equals the product of the expectation. And we call this, we call this uncorrelated. This is a definition okay. for random variables satisfying this property. We call them uncorrelated. Okay. So this correlation coefficient, it tells us how these two random variables are correlated with each other. For example, we can verify that this, the first statement is true. We can verify at least one direction. So if we, if we have y equals to a of x plus b, where a is a positive number, then we can show the correlation coefficient between x, y is exactly one. How to show that? Well, we just compute the correlation coefficient exactly. Compute CXY, compute sigma X, sigma Y. Now, CXY is by definition the covariance between X and Y. Right? So it's a covariance between X and Y. Now, Y equals to AX plus B. So we, we express Y as AX plus B. And here, this is a covariance between these two random variables. Now we can utilize the linearity, the linearity and the scaling property of covariance to decompose these terms. So you can check that by utilizing that property. I think here we are going to use the second one, the scaling property. Right. So one, one side we have ax plus b, the other side we have only x. So by the scaling property, it's basically, you know, the, here the coefficient is one, here's A. So it's one times A, we get A. And then the covariance between X and X, which is the variance of X. Okay, so this is CXY. So we have already got the numerator, uh, <coughs> numerator part. For the denominator part, we just need to get sigma Y because we want to express everything in terms of uh, sigma x. So sigma y squared, which is the variance of y, the variance of y. Now y equals to ax plus b, so we are looking at the variance of ax plus b. And by the scaling property of the variance, this equals to a squared times sigma x squared. So sigma y squared is a times sigma x squared. And now you plug plug in this uh, into this uh, correlation coefficient. So CXY is A times sigma X square. And the denominator, we have sigma X times sigma Y, but sigma Y is A times sigma X. So they, they get canceled with each other. So you only get one. And you can see that if A is negative, if, if we are <clears throat> having this case, then you get negative one. Why? Because here we still have A. <clears throat> Up to here, there's no problem. Here is a little bit different. So sigma Y squared equals to A squared sigma X squared. Now, once you take the square root, sigma y equals to, well, we have, we have to be careful. It's the absolute value of a times sigma x. This is the most general <coughs> expression. 
But now A is known to be negative. So absolute value of A is actually negative A. So that's why we, in this case, we get a negative sign. So when you plug it into this ratio, here is, is negative A times sigma X and you get negative one. So this is a little bit tricky in this case. Okay. So this is an example of computing the covariance between X, X and Y. Now, given that X and Y, these two random variables follow this joint uniform distribution in this triangular region. Right. So this is a triangular region between, uh, within this rectangle one, and uh, these two random variables, they are uniformly, they have a uniform density within this region. Because it's uniform, so we know that uh, the, joint de the joint density is a constant over the shaded area. But because the, <clears throat> we, because the accumulation of the density must be sum up to one. So from there, we can, we can infer that this constant is two because the area of this triangle is one half. So one half times two equals to one. So basically we are given the density, the joint density within this uh, triangular area. Now let's compute C, X, Y. We compute, we want to compute the covariance between these two random variables. And to do that, we are going to utilize this uh, equivalent expression of C, X, Y, which is the correlation subtract the product of the mean, right? So in that sense, we need to we need to compute all these three expectations. Well, the first expectation, the correlation R X Y, we compute it here. R X Y is defined as the expectation of the product, and because we know the joint density, we know it is supported on this uh, triangular area. So this expectation can be computed by you no. Know, calculating this double integration <clears throat> over this triangular area. So this is a double integration, right? Here we are in the outer integration, we are uh, looking at the X axis, right? So, so we are moving around the X axis. So the range on X is between zero and one, right? This triangular area. So this is the outer integration. Now, once we fixed an arbitrary X, for example, this red point, once we fix this point, in order to go over the entire triangular area, we have to integrate over this vertical, this red vertical line segment. And the range of this line segment, the, y, the range of this line segment on the Y axis is between zero and X because this is a y equals to x. So if this is x, then here we also have x. So the range of this red segment is from zero to x. And we are integrating over y, <clears throat> over the y-axis. Now you calculate this double integration, uh, which I will not go over the details. Yeah, and you get, you get this number, 104. Yeah, question. So why is this two? Because the air the area is one half, right? It's one times one divided by two, the triangular area. So we need to make sure the accumulation of the entire PDF sum up to one. Right. So it's the <clears throat> double integration of x f x y. equals to one. But in this case, this is a constant C. So this double integration simply becomes 
the density, the constant of the density times the area of the triangle. So this is equals to one. So we get C equals to the density has to be two. Okay. <clears throat> so this is how you calculate the first part, the correlation part. And then we need to work out these two parts, expectation parts, EX, EY. And to do that, by definition, we, uh, to compute the EX, we need to know the marginal density of X. Right? And this is not given directly, but it can be derived from the joint densities because the joints, once the joint density is given, everything's given. Okay. Now, from this figure, to compute the marginal density fx, we, we need to marginalize the joint density over y. Okay. So basically we need to accumulate the densities over the y direction and uh, assign them to the x axis. So which is basically integrating over this uh, red vertical line segments. So we integrate the joint density over y. Well, for each fixed x, we integrate over this uh, red line segment and then assign this integrated density to, to fx. So that is the marginalization. Now this, the range of this red segment is from zero to x. So now this density is a constant too. So you can work out this integration, you get two x, right? Which makes sense because once you integrate over y, all left is something depending on x. So in the end, you get something depending on x only. And the range of this one is between zero and one because x is, this, this shaded area is supported on the x axis between zero and one. So this is the marginalized PDF of fx. <clears throat> we have the PDF, we have the range. Once we have these two, we can compute the expectation. This integration over the range, zero and one, x times the PDF. Okay. This is the definition of expectation. So you work it out, it's two over three. And similarly for y, if we want to compute the marginalized PDF y, we do the same thing, but now we are going to marginalize over X. So we are going to integrate the joint density over X. But now once you fix each Y on the vertical axis, this blue curve, right? Once you fix each Y, we are going to integrate over this horizontal line segment and assign this integration to FY. Now this horizontal line segment, its range is between y and one. It, it, it starts from here. So we are integrating over the uh, horizontal axis. So horizontally, this line segment starts from here, the x coordinate is y, right? They are equal over this line segment. It's y and it ends at one. So it starts from y and, <clears throat> and ends at one. And you get such a marginalized PDF. Well, y, this PD, marginalized PDF is also supported on, uh, on the y-axis between zero and one. Between zero and one. So you have the marginalized PDF, you have the range, you can compute the expectation. Okay, you get one over three. And then the covariance okay, can be computed. <clears throat> it's one over 36, which is, which is positive. And this shows that X and Y are positively correlated. which makes sense because you, you can see that whenever X is positive, Y is also positive, right? So that's intuitively, that's why they are positively correlated. 
but their correlation is not that extreme. You know, the value is very close to zero. The correlation is not very high because if X and Y is perfectly positively correlated, then all the densities should concentrate on, on this uh, line segment, on this line. But now we can see that a large sum of the density is uh, distributing over uh, this uh, the other places away from this line. That's why their correlation, although it's positive, this correlation is actually very low. Okay, so this is how we calculate the covariance one by one. And we can show that there's a cauchy schwarz inequality, which is basically you know, used to prove the, I, I won't go, go into details, but this inequality says that, we can look at this one. It says that the, the correlation between these two random variables the, the absolute value of the correlation is less than or equal to it's less than or equal to the second product of the second moment taking square root. Here everything is random. We're talking about random variables. We are talking about their expectation or second order moments. Why we call this cauchy schwarz inequality for random variables? Because for real numbers, A and B, we have something similar. And in two real numbers, multiplied together is less than or equal to, uh, I think in this case, it would be, trivial for real numbers. Uh, let me think about that. Okay. I think I get it. For, for n in two vectors, their dot product is less than or equal to uh, the, the lens. Okay. And this holds for n in two vectors, not product less than equal square root of the length of x to the power of two times the length of y to the power of two. So the second moment in some sense can be you know, understood as a kind of length of the random variable. If you want to make this connection, but of course, here we are talking about very different things, the random variables and the expectation, but they have very similar structures. <clears throat> yeah. And the proof, this is a very short constructive proof. Uh, if you are interested, you can, you can look at it. It's very, a very smart idea. So it makes the proof uh, can be, finished within two or three lines. Okay. So, so now we have talked about you know, the, all the basic statistics, uh, the mean, correlation, covariance, correlation coefficient, okay, between two random variables. And continue this discussion we can, once we have, once we define this uh, basic statistics, we can describe some special pairs of random variables. For example, here we have uncorrelated and independent random variables. Now we say two random variables uncorrelated if they are, the expectation of the product can be decomposed as the product of the expectation, uncorrelated, which means 
the covariance, right? The covariance, co covariance is exactly the left minus the right. Now in this case, the covariance between x and y is zero. Now the covariance is zero. That means the correlation coefficient is zero, okay? Now, if this is zero, we say they are uncorrelated. Now, this is a correlation coefficient. If there are zero co correlation coefficient, it is uncorrelated. But it, it should be noted that it's different from this orthogonal, right? Here, if the cor here we define the correlation in this way. Now, if this correlation is zero, then we call them orthogonal. This is a little bit confusing, but I think well, every time you see this, go back and check the slides. Sometimes I, I also mess them up. So let's go back. If these holes, we call them uncorrelated. Okay. And this is because in this case, the correlation coefficient is zero. Now, at the same time, we define two random variables as independent random variables. If their joint density can be factorized into the product of the marginal densities. Right? And this kind of definition of independence we have seen since the starting, uh, since the beginning of this course where well, we define independent events. Here for random variables, we define them as in a similar way. And the independence is clearly a stronger definition compared to uncorrelated. Because if you integrate this equation over the densities, you can, this uh, integration of these densities will become expectation, right? So independence can imply uncorrelated, but uncorrelated cannot imply independence in general. Right. And this is to say we have we have uh, <coughs> we have shown this. If if this uncorrelated, if two random variables are uncorrelated, basically we are saying that the covariance is zero which is also implies that the co correlation coefficient is zero. And this fact is to say that independence can imply uncorrelated, but not the other way. This, this independence is a stronger, uh, a stronger notion of the, compared to the uncorrelated. And we have one example. This example shows that we can construct two random variables, u and v, which are independent, uh, which are not independent, but they are uncorrelated. Okay. So, okay. so this example is going to show that we can construct two random variables that are uncorrelated, but not independent. Okay. So this means that these two notion, notions, they are different. And uh, this one, independence is stronger than uncorrelated. And so let's look at this, this uh, simple example. X and Y are independent for nearly one half random variables. Basically, you can understand each of them as you know, flipping a fair coin. So X and Y would be the, the observation of the hat. <coughs> so Bernoulli means that it's a binary, right? X can take zero and one values. <coughs> now we define these two random variables. U is X plus Y, addition of the two. Well, V is the distance between the two. X minus Y of the, to the absolute value. And because we know the X and Y, all their distributions, very simple distributions, so we can compute the density or the probability mass function of this random variable U. First note that X plus Y can only take three values. 
because each x and each y is binary, only zero or one, right? So their addition can only be zero, one, or two. And because each of them takes equal, equally, equally likely can take values between zero and one. So to get zero, we have to, both x and y must be zero. So that gives one false probability. To get, to get two, both of them needs to be one. And that also give us one false probability. To get one, we have two different cases. So we get one, one half probability. And similarly, V also has two different realizations. And you can, you can compute that they are equally likely. So this is the densities, marginalized densities of U and V. <clears throat> Now, we, now let's verify that, first of all, these two random variables are dependent. How, how can we verify that? Well, we, we to, show the, to show that they are dependent, it is essentially you know, to show that they are not independent. So let's consider the probability of, an, of this joint event. Now, if this, two random variables are independent, then this probability should be equal to the product of the individual probabilities, right? By the definition of independence. But now let's look at these two separately. First of all, calculating the probability of this joint event, u equals two means x plus y equals two. V equals to one means this one equals to one. You can check that none of the realizations of X and Y can satisfy these two e equalities simultaneously. Therefore, this is an empty event. But you can check that because X and Y can only take values zero and one. Therefore, this probability is zero. But on the other hand, the marginalized probabilities are not zero. The probability of u equals to two has uh, one, one fourth probability. Probability of v equals to one has one half. So this decomposed the product is not zero. This shows that clearly they are not independent. So they are dependent. They are dependent. And now we, let's verify that they are uncorrelated. To show that, we just need to show that the expectation of the product equals to the product of the expectation. And the expectation of the product, uh, by definition, is the expectation of the x plus y times x minus y to the absolute value. And x and y has two realizations. So this expectation can be computed by summing over the four for different scenarios. And for in each sum, we are looking at this realization weighted by the corresponding joint density. Now, if you check this sum carefully, uh, it is very easy to calculate. So in the end, you get one half. <clears throat> you just plug in all different combinations, four different combinations of X and Y into this, these terms, okay? So this is the correlation between these two. And then for the marginalized uh, expectations, since we know they are PD PMF, we can compute them easily. So we can compute the expectation of U and expectation of V, okay? And you can check that indeed, the product of the expectations equals to the expectation of the product. They are equal. So in this sense, these two are uncorrelated. Right. So this is an illustrative example. So I will skip this part. You can check this one by yourself. 
we are given a uniform random variable and uh, another y is defined as x to the power of two, we want to show that they are uncorrelated. Well, to verify this, you just need to you know, verify this relation, which requires computing all these expectations. Right? So in the end, the question reduces to how to compute the joint PDF and marginalized PDF. And you realize that this is a function of random variables, right? So we are given X, we are given another Y equals X squared. This is a pair of random variables. So we can, we can compute their joint distribution by the fundamental theorem. How do we do that? Well, I define u equals to x and y equals to x. Um, let me, x squared, yeah. Okay, let, let me use some other notations. For example, let me call this b instead of y. Right. So u equals to x, v equals to x squared. Now we can compute their joint PDF using the fundamental theorem of uh, two two a pair of random variables. I'm using this one. But you can see that this is even simpler because each of them depends on a single random variable, right? So you can assume there's another y, which is actually not involved in this. You can call this g, x, y. You can call this h, x, y. But y is kind of, I mean, it, it does not, it is not involved in this uh, equations. So, so essentially, G X Y only depends on X, right? So these Jacobians will become zero. So everything would be uh, <clears throat> yeah, everything would be uh, simple. Now the other way to do this is to you know, follow instead of looking view this as a two random variables. I think a simpler way is to directly look at the PDF of V, right? Because this is a relatively simple function. So it's X squared less than small V. And then you can follow the standard approach to derive the CDF function. Once you have CDF, you can do the PDF. And we have this uh, very useful fact that says that uh, if X and Y are uncorrelated, then their variance is decomposable. So variance of X plus Y equals to variance of X plus variance of Y. And this is a derivation. But you know, in general, this does not hold. Why? Because variance of X plus Y is the covariance by definition of X plus Y with itself. Now apply the linearity of covariance. We get covariance X, X plus covariance X, Y plus covariance Y, X plus covariance Y, Y. Right. And these two are variances. Now these two are equal. Right? Covariance between x and y equals to covariance between y and x. You can check that. So it's equals to two times covariance between x and y. So this is the gen general formula for decomposing the variance. 
right? But in this case, if they are uncorrelated, then of course the covariance part disappears. Uncorrelated means we have zero covariance. So in that in that case, the variance can be perfectly decomposable. <clears throat> so for example, if we want to um, find the variance of a binomial random variable, binomial NP means that this corresponds to we are performing N trials and each trial succeeds with probability P. Now, this random variable corresponds to the number of success of these n trials. So find the variance of this random variable. So in the previous lectures, we have discussed this uh, trick. So such a binomial random variable can be decomposed as a sum of Bernoulli random variables, zero and one, zi, right? So each zi indicates the success of the ice trial. Right? So it's a binary indicator. Once you sum up all these zi's, that gives x the number of success. So each zi is iid Bernoulli, Bernoulli random variable. Now, because of that, the x is summation of zi, where all the zi's are independent. So therefore, we can leverage this, uh, this formula. So the variance of x can be directly decomposed into the sum of the variance of each zi, right? Because to do that, we need uncorrelated, but here all the zi's are independent, which is stronger than uncorrelated. Right? So the, all the zi's, they are guaranteed to be uncorrelated. Therefore, we can leverage this decomposable, uh, this, uh, this formula to decompose the entire, the variance of the entire summation into the summation of the individual variance. Now the, the thing is that each zi is only a Bernoulli random variable. So the variance is very simple to compute. Okay, it's a zero one Bernoulli random variable. So the variance turns out to be P times one minus P. And you sum over all the variances of all the zi's, you get NP times one minus P. So this is the variance. Well, for the expectation, we just leverage the linearity. So it's a sum of the expectation. Uh, it's basically n times the expectation of each zi, okay, which is p. So in, so in this way, right, if we can decompose a big random variable into some of smaller ones, then the, these statistics can be, can be easily computed by decomposing them into smaller statistics. And we can prove the following Bernoulli theorem, uh, which define, which shows a concentration bound on such a real event. Okay. Let's, let's, let's understand this theorem. We don't have to remember it. Uh, <clears throat> This theorem says that now let x be the number of, uh, okay. So basically let x be a binomial distribution, binomial random variable. It's the number of success among these n trials. Now, empirically you want to do this. So you do n experiments and you observe, empirically you observe the number of success. Then you want to estimate the success the succeed the success rate. So the way you estimate is very simple. It's the number of success that you observed divided by the number of trials you, you performed. And you expect that once you perform maybe a million trials, a sufficient large number of trials, this estimation will be very close to the underlying true estimation. Right? So the underlying true estimation is P, where P is the probability of success for each individual trial. So therefore, empirically, you want this is an empirical estimator. Well, this is the under, underlying truth. And we are looking at their deviations. Right. So this theorem characterizes 
the deviation between your empirical estimate and the underlying truth in a prob probabilistic way. Right? Because this is a <coughs> fixed constant, P. Well, this is something depend on the random variable X. Right? So this entire deviation can be viewed as a function of X. So this is a function of random variable X. And this event, this entire event is defined as such a deviation bigger than epsilon. Okay. So we are looking at the probability of this event. This event is that the deviation of your empirical estimate from the, the underlying true success, success rate is bigger than epsilon. And Bernoulli's theorem says that this event is, is a rare event in the sense that the probability of this event is less than or equal to this number. Okay. <clears throat> so, which means if you want to, if you perform a very large number of experiments, let's say n equals to a million, and on the right hand side you have a one million on the denominator, which makes you no know, makes this seem very very small, right? And in that case, you will, you can say that okay, if, if I perform one million experiments, then the deviation bigger than epsilon, this event occurs with a very small probability. Right? I'll put it out of the way, most likely the deviation should be smaller than epsilon. Right. So this is called, we have, we have talked about this before, the Markov inequality, Chebyshev, Chernoff. Now this is a special uh, case of the, for the Bernoulli, uh, for the binomial random variables. Okay. The proof is, very, is a very simple application of the Markov inequality, right? This is the original <coughs> Markov inequality that applies to positive random variables with a finite mean. Okay. Now let's, let's try to apply this to, the, to this case to prove the theorem. So this event is equivalent to, you know, I can multiply both sides by n. So it's, it's equivalent to x minus np bigger than an epsilon. Okay, these two are equivalent. And this is also equivalent to, I can raise it to the power of two because both sides, they are positive. I assume epsilon is a positive accuracy that you want. I can raise it to the power of two, still the same. And then I view this as a random variable, this as a threshold. And I apply the Markov inequality. So this, you treat this as Y and you treat this as A, you apply the Markov inequality, right? This can be applied because now Y is indeed positive because it's a square, uh, raise it to the power of two. So you apply the Markov inequality is less than or equal to the expectation of this random variable. So the expectation of this one divided by this threshold, n square epsilon square. And, we, and this is exactly the variance of x, the variance of x, because inside we have x minus the mean, right? The mean of x is exactly np. So the x minus the mean to the power of two, taking expectation, is exactly the variance. And we have shown that the variance is np times one minus p. So, and you can simplify this quantity that proves this uh, Bernoulli's theory. It's a very simple concentration uh, inequality. <clears throat> so it's a simple application of the Markov inequality, but in this case, we get a reasonably strong concentration bound. <clears throat> to apply this concentration bound, you can quickly check that if, if I want to set, because this bound holds for any and epsilon, right? So you can specify an epsilon 
uh, any epsilon that, that that of your interest. Let's say I want to put this accuracy to be 10 to the power negative five. So I claim that, okay, the probability that my, the deviation of my estimate is bigger than epsilon will be you know, 10 to the power negative five will be less than or equal to P, one minus P. Okay, let's assume P is one half for simplicity. So this is 10 to the power negative 10. If, we, if I want to control this deviation to be, you know, this probability to be less than or equal to a certain, if we want this probability, this probability to be less than or equal to 10 to the power negative three, we want to make sure this, this estimate uh, has a very little probability to deviate more than 10 to the power, power of negative five. Then we can simply set this one to be equal to 10 to the power of negative three. So it's P one minus P and 10 negative 10, set it to be less than or equal to this desired bound. And we can show that in order to do that, N must be bigger than or equal to P one minus P, um, 10 to the power of seven, which means you have to perform this number of, uh, it, is, it is sufficient to perform you know, roughly 10 million trials in order to guarantee that your empirical estimate deviates from the true truth, no more than 10 to the power of negative five with a confidence le level, you know, one minus 10 to the power of negative three. That's a long statement, but well, th these are the parameters that you can play with. Okay, we can <coughs> briefly look at lecture 19. Yeah, so lecture 19, we're going to talk about <coughs> a very special case of uh, these two random variables. Case is the joint Gaussian, Gaussian random variables. We know we have we have defined the Gaussian <coughs> Gaussian PDF for a single random variable, right? X mu sigma square. Right? We have the Gaussian PDF, and now we have a more general a joint Gaussian. This X and Y, each of them is Gaussian, but and moreover they are jointly Gaussian. So this is a joint Gaussian PDF for a zero for the zero mean case. If it's not zero means, uh, could be a little bit more complicated. And for Gaussian uh, joint Gaussian random variables, uh, because Gaussian is very important in practice. So for joint Gaussian random variables, it has many nice properties and special properties. So we will talk about it uh, in the next time. So after that, yeah, we are going to talk about some conditional PDF. Uh, I think we have defined this before. Uh, very similar to the conditional probability, right? It's basically a joint PDF over the conditional, the PDF of the conditional variable. So if, if you stick with this definition, everything would be very, very uh, intuitive. And once we have this conditional PDF, we can define the conditional expectation. Okay. Again, 
just cheat this, uh, replace the joint PDF or the PDF by the conditional PDF in the definition of expectation. Okay. And uh, yeah, that should. I think we can finish that in the next lecture. So let me just give a one sentence introduction of this joint Gaussian. <clears throat> so we say two random variables are joint Gaussian. And, and here for simplicity, let's first consider zero mean random variables, right? zero mean. Now two zero mean random variables are jointly Gaussian with parameter rho if their joint PDF takes the following form, okay? which looks like a Gaussian PDF because you know we have this coefficient part, we have this exponential part, and inside we have this quadratic part for the random variables divided by some constants. And following this standard uh, definition, this row is actually the correlation coefficient between X and Y, which means if you utilize this joint PDF and follow the definition of correlation coefficient, you do some calculations and you can figure out indeed the correlation, co cor correlation coefficient associated with this P joint PDF is exactly rho. Okay, it's exactly rho. That's why we introduce this rho in this uh, standard form so that we know that this is a very, very important statistics between X and Y for joint Gaussian and random variables. And <clears throat> this is like a example illustration of this joint PDF in the 3D space. And this is the projection on the 2D space. Well, this depending on the value of the row, basically depending on whether these two random variables are positively or negatively correlated, the orientation of this uh, ellipsoid will be will change. Okay, I think this means that in this example, it means that they are positively correlated because the orientation is kind of towards the positive side. <clears throat> And there's a very important fact is that if, if we are given this joint, uh, such a joint Gaussian distribution, then uh, <clears throat> we can calculate that the marginal distribution, uh, which, which is F, for example, Fy or Fx, both of them are the, are the standard Gaussian distribution. So X and Y, the marginalized distribution, um, always the standard normal distribution. But for such a standard joint Gaussian distribution. <clears throat> and you can actually derive, prove this by marginalizing the, the, the above joint PDF over either X or Y, okay? Following some standard, uh, steps of integration, you can check that, you can verify that. <clears throat> and, and also for this, for such a pair of random variables, the covariance is, is equal to rho because rho equals to covariance divided by the standard deviation. But in this case, we have shown that their marginalized PDFs are standard Gaussian PDFs. Therefore, the, their deviations, standard deviation is one. These two are one. So that's why the covariance is exactly the correlation coefficient. So put, put it another way, this joint Gaussian PDF describes uh, all the scenarios that this 
arbitrary two standard uh, Gaussian random variables can can interact, right? If you are given two standard Gaussian random variables, then their join distribution is always takes such a form for a certain row, where row denotes how correlated they are. So this is a very general formula for joint PDF between two standard Gaussian uh, random variables. Of course, for non-standard Gaussian random variables, we have another general joint PDF. That might be much more complicated and we will introduce that later. But here, we let's keep the discussion simple. Okay, so I think uh, I will stop here and uh, Again, I will hold the office hours starting at 1 p.m.